welcome back to the podcast, everyone. Our guest is a digital learning initiative consultant for the North Carolina Department of Public Instruction, and she's the author of the ISTE published book, The EdTech Coaching Primer, Supporting Teachers in the Digital Age Classroom. Welcome to the podcast, Dr. Ashley McBride. Thank you. I'm excited to be here. We're excited to have you, and thanks to uh, ISTE for hooking us up with you it's all it's all exciting it's all exciting if isti um, didn't do it i would have expected brad to <laughs> there you go there you go i mean you were a guest on my other podcast real early on so yes. that is only fair that you come join us now that i'm here yes. awesome so ashley i was surprised and and honestly probably a little disappointed when the the lockdown started in march 2020 and there were huge like shocking amounts of teachers who still had no idea you know what an lms was for example um how to use it and how to uh, you know even like turn it on and and get it working it it seems like we spent decades yeah um (laughs) we literally like i i i i remember being in sessions on like in in like 2013 and 2014 on things like blackboard and then you know and then it was schoology in 2015 and then yeah. it was google classroom in 2017 and but con- like a de- almost a decade um trying to move people into the modern technological age of teaching um and we were still completely unprepared for remote learning is that is that a fair assessment of kind of where we were in in March 2020 because that's what it felt like to me I think it really depends on where you were specifically as um, a teacher if you were in a place where you already had one-to-one devices um, you had support for those devices you weren't just thrown devices at you Um, you had support in the form of professional learning or I mean coaching or um, administrators even teaching and training and supporting as they're doing um, their professional learning and their evaluations of uh, their teachers. If you had that, then I think there was an easier transition. Um, But no, I think your your assessment is very fair Um, because I remember when I became an ed tech coach, which was my first... um, transition outside of the classroom so I was a classroom teacher and I wanted to do something with the carts that were in the school building and I tried Mm -hmm. to check them out every week tried to do something with them and I could tell I wasn't doing it very well so I started uh, working on a graduate program for educational technology so I was trying to learn this stuff and what's funny is I was in a state and in the state of North Carolina, we have an ISTE affiliate in CTIES that has been an affiliate since the 70s, I believe. I mean, it's been a long, it's been out for there for a long time. I had no idea it existed until I moved to a different district and became an ed tech coach. And somebody said, you should go to this conference. I didn't know what ISTE was. I didn't mm-hmm. participate in Twitter. I didn't know any of that stuff. Um, and that's somebody who was in the classroom trying to use the computers. So I think a lot of it was teachers are just so overwhelmed. I mean, I was in secondary and I had over a hundred students every year and I was grading a hundred research papers and a hundred essays and a hundred short stories. I mean, it's just, it's, it's crazy the amount of work that is put on these teachers um, or teachers in general, all teachers. Um, but I think that that's kind of where a lot of that stems from is it's that information is out there and it's not that it's not accessible, it's time and how to get that information to somebody in a way that it actually impacts them in that moment. And I think that's the piece that we were missing. And hmm. of course, COVID hits and everybody's pushed into it. <laughs> yeah, you know, um, the the book the you the the ed tech coaching primer is um it, i know that it started before covid stuff started but i also know that 
you know, my own experience when the pandemic hit as an instructional technology coach. And all of a sudden, I, I joke with people sometimes that the pandemic hit and all of a sudden, instead of being an ed tech coach for one school, everyone suddenly needed me mm -hmm. to be able to help them because all of a sudden everyone needed to use technology every day. So can you maybe like sort of how did the book come about as a, and, and what is sort of the, the foundation, the goal of the book, if you will? So this book was actually a seed that was planted when I was an ed tech coach myself, which was long before COVID. Um, I was trying to figure out what I was supposed to do as an ed tech coach because I had never had one, but I had gone and done this master's program. And then I found out that there was a coaching position that did this. And I thought, man, I get to help people play with technology. That sounds fun. Um, I show up in the job. The teachers didn't really know what to expect from me. The principal didn't really know what to ask me to do other than make sure that, you know, AP tests that worked on the computers, you know, went flawlessly. Um, make sure that the projectors are working. Go help the teachers with cool technology things. Um, but nobody set anything up for me. And I'm the type of person where I need, like, structure. And I, I like checklists and I like things that I'm supposed to be doing. So it was me kind of growing into this position where I did a lot of research on how I could get my teachers better professional development on um, digital teaching and learning strategies. Uh, I knew that I didn't want to just do a um, session once a week or once a month where I was going, here's a cool tech tool, here's a cool tech tool, here's a cool tech tool, and then them just try to use them if they worked. Because that's the way PD was thrown at me as a teacher. Um, I remember sitting in an ed puzzle, and I never used ed puzzle until I was an ed tech coach. Even though I had the computers in my class, they would have been, it would have been fantastic. But the timing of when I had that ed tech tool training, it was literally thrown at me like, hey, this is a cool thing. And then nobody talked to me about it. Nobody talked to me about how to implement it. There was nothing about my curriculum specific um, needs. And I kind of was like, why am I sitting here? I need to grade papers. <laughs> I have 100 research papers sitting on my desk. I need to be there, not here. Um, so as a coach, I wanted to build a structure that worked for my teachers. And that's whenever I started doing professional development. And I started trying to do coaching with it. Uh, and I started to build a structure there. I left that position and I was having a conversation with a, with a high ranking administrator one day. And that individual said to me, you know, I don't think you need an ed tech coach in every single school. And I truly disagreed with that. I said, no, no, every, every school needs an ed tech coach. Look at what I was able to accomplish. And essentially what was said to me was that it's because of who I was because I was trying to work and, and, and just the way that I, I was, I was the reason why that that position worked. And I did not believe that. I knew it was because I had built some sort of structure that helped me to really help teachers um, integrate. And I had had something come about it. Like I felt like that if you brought a person in and really helped to kind of frame up their job and the administrator understood and the teachers understood what to ask, then it could be done elsewhere. It wasn't just me. Um, so then I get a position as a tech director and I was able to have an ed tech coach in every single building, which was phenomenal. And that's when COVID hit. And having a ed tech coach in every single building, what we were able to do was astronomical. Um, because we had somebody for every teacher, they knew exactly who to go to mm. for support. Um, they didn't even have to ask. The, those teachers were so used to those people in the building that when COVID hit and they didn't know what to do, those, those ed tech coaches in those buildings were getting emails and emails and emails. So, so I'm uh, sorry. So Ashley, you, you started to make the case for the, the actual next question. So I wanna actually interrupt you because I, I mean, what we're seeing in a lot of school districts is the morphing of a role where they hi they initially hire an ed tech coach, but then that ed tech coach turns into a generalist, mm -hmm. right? A, 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 a more you know, non-ed techy pedagogical coach, which is, I mean, those are important as well. And there are a lot of those, but they're initially hired as this ed tech coach and 
And one of the actual, like, really interesting ways we've seen kind of this mentality shift is in is in conferences, for example, where there used to be a lot of conferences specifically related to ed tech, mm -hmm. like in technology. And like there were there was like a whole there was a whole company that all they did were iPad conferences, right? That ed tech teacher uh, or or whatever they did iPad summits all over the place. I went to one in Boston. It was awesome. It's where I met Carl Hooker and and it's like and then he did he did actually this is another good example. Carl Hooker did iPad Palooza in in Austin for you know a long time and but uh, slowly a lot of these conferences um, ties in Minnesota switching to Impact Education Conference where it's not as much a technology and instruction co conference but a kind of a broader education conference so my my question was going to be our um is is the ed tech coaching role becoming obsolete and i think your answer is no and so i want you to i want you to keep making the case for it with with that context in mind no i don't think so because it, everything changes so fast um it wasn't that long ago that I was an ed tech coach and we had 24, 25 carts and a school for a hundred teachers. That's not the world we live in anymore. So what I was working with those teachers on, you know, those few years ago is not what their current ed tech coach is working on them with now. Um, also, there's so much um, growth for uh, teachers that the, the ed tech, the technology is not going away. And you need somebody there who's going to always say, you know, let me go figure this out or let's, you know, let's work together to figure this out. Not saying that any other coach wouldn't do that, but a technology coach is the type of person who's not afraid to touch and break the technology because they know they can turn around and fix it again. Because uh, you have teachers that you have to, um, I had one teacher actually who would not set anything up unless I was in the room with her and told her exactly what to press and when to press it. Cause I think she thought she was going to break the internet and I, I, <laughs> that's just the way it was. Um, but somebody who can be there for the, for some of those technical pieces too, but also talk about the pedagogy about bringing that technology in. Because otherwise you end up with digital worksheets and that's not where we want to go at all. We don't want right. to mimic the 20th century learning on a computer. We want to do something different. Hmm. Yeah. It, you know, one of the things you said before we started recording is that, you know, you don't necessarily focus on ed tech tools as much as pedagogy around the technology and using the technology. Um, and that's something that I always said as an ed tech coach, um, you know, I didn't start that way. And, and you talk a lot in the book about sort of the roles of an ed tech coach over time and the misconception that like, oh, that's the person that fixes something. My first year as an ed tech coach, I installed so many printers, like just <laughs> printer after printer after printer. And in my head, I thought I can be helpful. And then that gets me respect and people know I deserve this position. And I was like, you know, fighting an imposter syndrome by installing printers, which is ineffective. It's not a good mental health strategy. But yeah. like I, when I got my second role as an ed tech coach, and even when that one started to evolve, I realized how I could be more effective as a coach. And I think that looking through the book that it kind of follows that, but could you just sort of much better than me talking about in printers, maybe your your vision of the role as someone who's not just uh, fixing technology or, you know, there's some, I don't know that go with what I just said. That's, that's a, I mean, that's a constant problem is uh, they see the word technology next to it. So in North Carolina, they call it an instructional technology facilitator, which is a mouthful. Um, and sometimes people just hear that word technology and they think, oh, you're going to come fix um, my stuff. You're going to make sure my printer is working. You're going to make sure that the projector's up and all of that. Um, I asked my coaches to subscribe to something called the 10 minute rule because I did not, um, want them stuck in just fixing things. Um, we want an ed tech coach to be in the classroom doing coaching cycles, co-planning, co-teaching, um, 
working on deep data dives with teachers and really focusing on instruction. Um, so is that kind of what you, <laughs> I don't know that I, I said that much better than you did. <laughs> Listen, I'm sure you did. Um, although although uh, the, the work on page 36 of the book does speak for itself. I think that's just the greatest, greatest page of the book. Is, I'm just is that the page you're on? Oh, is it? I didn't, I didn't, I didn't notice. I was dying to hear how he was going to weasel his damn name into this episode. Somehow it was going to happen. And I, I, I almost challenged him to do it. And you did. I'm glad you did. It, I'm I'm glad we got there. It's good. <laughs> yes, Brad is one of the vignette writers in the book. He did write a page. Thank you, Brad. A page and that put page my wife. 36. A page that put my wife to sleep when I read it to her. So it's high quality material. It's high quality <laughs> material. So I thought it was good enough to put in there. So. <laughs> so I'm I'm stealing a note that Brad wrote wrote in our in our in our outline, um, because I, I do think it's super interesting. Um, and, and there's a funny comparison. So, so for example, um, taxes, um, um, punishment type taxes, smoking taxes, for example, taxes on cigarettes, right? As you progressively tax on cigarettes, the tax is supposed to actually, you know, slowly go away, you know, as people stop smoking. And then all of a sudden you have a tax that no one is really paying because no one's smoking anymore. Um, and, and, as that relates to ed tech here we go uh i'm gonna say hop skip and I, a jump we're right I there can. i'm very I'm interested in figure in understanding where you're going with this <laughs> no so the idea is 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 that you know having an ed tech coach in every school is is awesome but you know don't you eventually work your way out of a job in the sense that once you've you know you, you you've gotten yourself to a position in the school where they're super capable, uh, super adept at, at technology. They are able to discover things on their own. That's the dream. And, and then, <laughs> you know, so, so is that the dream? Is that what you're trying to do is that, basically that would make be the, the position dream. obsolete by raising the technology level higher? I mean, that, that would be the dream, but then you would have to say that everybody in the school is beyond growth, and I don't think that's ever the case. Mm -hmm. um, so if you notice, and I mean, in the book, I talk about the importance of coaching cycles, like going in there, having the teacher work on goals for themselves, having somebody to come in and observe and have the teacher reflect and provide feedback and, and get that feedback and to take a plan and figure out how to help that teacher grow. I mean, this is something I've, I never had as a classroom teacher and I would have loved it. And I know that I've done presentations and things like that. And I've asked people, I was like, could you please tell me what I could have done, what you think I could have done better? Or when I think about what I did, I think this, what do you think of my assessment of what I just did? Am I being too harsh on myself? Am I, could you next time? Because um, I would do this at work sometimes. Could you next time um, watch for this? Make sure that I'm not teaching to the right of the room, or which is just a go-to example because I used to do that. Um, Right-handed, I would only teach to the right side of the class. I don't know why I did that. Um, but a student said that to me one day. They're like, you know you're always looking over there. Um, but that's just, I mean, that's a little tiny thing. But we're talking about huge concepts. We're talking about blending learning. We're talking about taking teachers who have never taught online until this past year or so um, and trying to give them good online teaching strategies. Because I don't know that remote learning is ever truly going to go away now mm. that we can, you know, eliminate snow days um, and, you know, bad weather days or, you know, we all thought we were kind of coming out of COVID and now there's this back and forth. I know Brad, you're in Florida, so that's a different world altogether. What's COVID? Um, <laughs> I don't know what that is. That's not no idea. But in the rest of the world, <laughs> huh. there's now what's, different what's, variants and what's some snow? kids. <laughs> <laughs> also, what's snow? <laughs> <laughs> what is snow? Um, I, I mean, you have hurricane days. So, I mean, you've got your own your own stuff going on down there. <laughs> um, but I don't think that the stuff is going away. And a big concept like how do you do blended learning? How do you do personalized learning? 
how do you do like these are huge concepts that are going to take entire careers to really get to really practice at it i mean uh teachers are just like doctors and the fact that it's it's a practice doctors are never perfect um and we are constantly practicing our craft and to have somebody there that you can say listen i've been doing this unit for five six years I really would like to do something different with it. Can you come in and we can co-plan together? Like, I don't think that goes away. Hmm. Yeah, I, I, uh, you know, I agree because it's very much how I've structured my own role as an ed tech coach. And you and I have talked about that before, but, um, I, I kind of want to ask one other thing, because one of the things you, you know, you don't, as an ed tech coach, you don't personally focus on the specific tools, right? But that is kind of part of the job, right? It's like you need to know the tools in order to be able to implement them. So I guess maybe how do you vet when a new, let's say a new, cool, amazing ed tech tool comes out and everybody starts talking about it? How do you sort of go from hearing about it to vetting it to maybe saying, okay, here's where we might be able to integrate it when I'm coaching another teacher. An innovative 24 seven online tutor. I, I almost went there. I <laughs> almost did it. Oh man. Hey, if you get one, I get one. <laughs> <laughs> the first thing I would do is check for privacy issues with student, student data privacy. Um, so that's something that I think ed tech coaches really can support teachers in right now because I mean they've been in this panic mode for over a year of let me grab what's what's going to be easy and I'm going to use with my te my students and let's knock this out but are they grabbing things that you know are okay with student data privacy or are we giving students data away to third parties um, that are going to you know sell it off and do nefarious things um, so there's that. Um, and then there is, what does the, what does the tech tool solve? Is it actually solving some sort of problem or is it actually supporting something? Um, so I always had my ed tech coaches use the Tripoli framework by Liz Kolb. Um, and I love the Tripoli framework. Um, have you guys spoken about that at all on this show yet? Mm -mm. No, I don't think so. Not Have you guys yet. read her book? No. No. Okay, so she's also an ISTE author, and she has a really good book called um, Learning First, Technology Second. And that book kind of breaks down how you determine whether you're using a tool effectively. Is it engaging? Does it enhance the lesson? And there's a third E, and of course, I can't remember it off the top of my head. Um, <laughs> But uh, I think that as an ed tech coach, what I used to do and what I do whenever I'm suggesting is I never suggest just one tool. Is I actually, like I might observe or I might have a conversation and they say, I really want to do this. Well, how am I going to do that? Well, here's two or three different options of how that can be done. And this tool does this and this tool does this and this tool does this and then we play with it. Um, but as an ed tech coach, I always play with the tools. So I had like five or six Google accounts where I, you know, this one was student one, two, three, this was student two, four, five, and <laughs> just playing with it and seeing uh, if it's user friendly um, and meeting the goal, which is most important. So the ed tech coaching primer, it's not out just yet. We have it in our hot little hands, but- uh, It is out. Is it out now? Oh, yes. well, then I'm going to re-say that. It has started shipping. <laughs> well, then I'm going to re-say that. All right, friends. The Ed Tech Coaching Primer is out now, apparently. And you can uh, order it on ISTE. You can order it from Amazon. You can go to the edtechcoachingprimer.com and click on links to order it there for sure as well and learn more uh, about Ashley while you're at it. Uh, Ashley, thank you so much for joining us on the podcast. This was great. Thank you for having me. Yeah, thanks, Ashley.